abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. We say, blessed be his name forever. Majesty, we give you praise. Blessed be your name in the mighty name of Jesus. Beloved, our God deserves the highest praise. What a wonderful God we serve. Mighty God, the God that prunes us. The God that prunes us, our gardener. What a mighty God we serve. Blessed be his name forever. Child of God, there is a prayer you must pray. There is a prayer I must pray. There's a prayer we must pray for ourselves. Child of God is in Psalm 139, verse 23 to verse 24. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. It is a prayer for me to pray. It is a prayer for you to pray, beloved child of God. To ask the Lord, our maker. And we say, Lord, search me. Search me. Know my heart. Know my heart. Then test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Know my strong desires. Know my will. Know that thing that is eating the topmost part of my heart. Lord, know my heart. Then point out to me anything in me that offends you. Anything in me that offends you. Lord, point it out to me. Then lead me along the path of everlasting life. It's a prayer that you must pray. It's a prayer that I must pray. That the Lord will show us the things inside us that offends him. The things inside us that offends him. Why? So that he can prune it out of us. So that he can cleanse it out of us. So that we can bear more fruit, child of God. Why? It is because of the way the anointing works. It is because of the way the grace of God works. It is because of the way God does his things, child of God. Because of the way God moves. Because of the way God moves, don't forget he's not a man. He's not a man. He's not a man. He is God Almighty. Beloved, let us understand him from 1 Samuel chapter 16. I am reading from verse 1 to verse 13. The Bible says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flax with oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there. For I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a high far with you, the Lord replied. And say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? They asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. Verse 6, when they arrived, Samuel looked, took one look at Eli and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son, Abinadab, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemaiah. But Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven sons of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields 
watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Samuel sent for so Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flags of oil and he brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Child of God, there is a prayer that you must pray. And that there is a prayer that I also must pray. And that is the prayer that it says very clearly, Lord, search me. See if there is anything inside me that offends you. If there is anything inside me that is not pleasing unto you, why? Purge it out of me so that you can lead me on the path of eternal life. Child of God, there is a way God does his things. There is a way God does his things that requires me and you to pray this prayer that David prayed. Do you know why the Bible says that God rejected Saul? God rejects people. It does not matter the relationship you have had with him in the past. God rejects people. God rejects people. God chooses people. God chooses where to pour his oil. God chooses where to pour his grace. That is the reason whereby why we have to pray this prayer. We have to pray this prayer because the Bible says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. He rejected a man. He didn't stop there. When we go to verse 7, the Bible, the Bible said something very, very clear. The Bible tells us that when Samuel was trying to use his human reasoning to make a choice. The Bible tells us that God said he does not judge the way we judge. He said he looks at the heart. He looks at the heart. And verse 8 says something. And Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemaiah. But Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Think about it. The Lord chooses. The Lord chooses. And that's why we must pray this prayer. Because you cannot force the hand of God. I cannot force the hand of God. It is for us to meet the requirement of the living God. It is for us to meet the requirement of the living God. Look at what happened in this place. The Bible tells us in verse 5, Yes, Samuel replied, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. Look at what happened there. Before they could come before the Lord, the instruction was given, purify yourself. They purified themselves in the secret place. And then they came to Samuel again. And Samuel had to purify them. Do you know what was about to happen? The oil was going to flow. The grace was going to flow. The anointing was about to flow. God was choosing. God was choosing. God was choosing. Child of God. Let us learn what happened there. Despite all that that they did, the master looked at their heart and he said, no, I have rejected this one. No, I have not chosen this one. No, I have rejected. Strong words. God rejected. God also said, I have not chosen. I have not chosen. Child of God, let us not forget something that the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 22. The reason whereby you have to pay attention to this. I have to pay attention to this. Do you know why? It is written in Matthew 22 verse 14 that many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. It is happening here. Many of them were called. Many were called. But it took God to choose. And so God has called me. God has called me. God has called all of us. But has God chosen us? 
Are we chosen vessels in his hands? Are we chosen vessels in his hands? Beloved, I want us to note something and learn something from that passage. Because from verse 11 to verse 13, there is a strong message for us there. The Bible says, then Samuel asked, are these all the songs you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goat. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark, handsome, with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. Beloved, let us learn something. He didn't follow them for the purification rites. He wasn't there when the instruction came and said, sons of Jesse, go and purify yourself. He wasn't there when Jesse gathered his sons and emphasized that we are going for a meeting. Did you remember, do you remember what Samuel said? You have to cleanse, you have to purify yourself. And when they even got to the meeting, they had to be purified again. David was not there when that happened. Yet, the anointing fell on him. Yet, he was the chosen one. Yet, the grace of God flowed in his life. Why? When he was alone in the secret place. You know what happened? This is David's lifestyle. Search me, Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That means that God must have looked down in the heart of David. And what did he see? A heart that is acceptable before him. A heart that is pleasing unto him. A heart that he can walk with. A heart that he can choose. And so, beloved, we don't have to wait for emergency purification because it might disqualify us still. We need to make it our lifestyle to say, Lord, search me. What is it that I'm doing that offends you? Father, please deliver me. Father, please purge me. Father, please cleanse me. Father, please sanctify me. It is a prayer that you must pray. It is a prayer that I must pray. It is a prayer for us to pray. As beloved children of the living God. Do you know why? The Bible tells us in Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. It says, catch the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyards of love, for the grapevines are blossoming. The Bible said we should catch the foxes. There are foxes in our lives that can ruin what God has come to do in us. And that's why we must pray, Lord, search me. Anything that is in me that is offensive to you, Anything that is in me that does not glorify you, Father, please purge it out of my life. Take away the little foxes. Take away the it doesn't matter. Take away I don't care. Take away it is my life. Don't judge me. Let us take it away from us. Let us take it away from us because the little foxes, the little foxes spoil the vine. The little foxes spoil the vine. So David knew how to deal with his heart in the secret. So that even without following them to do the rituals of the purification, he wasn't there. Yet his heart was the heart that took the oil. His heart was the heart that took the oil. That's why the word of God tells us very clear. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and I am reading from verse 1 to verse 2. The eternal words of the living God. He says I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. He prunes the branches the branches that do bear fruit so they produce even more. Beloved, did you follow the reading of that passage? The Bible tells us that Jesus is the true grapevine. His father, that is God Almighty, is the gardener. And there is a work that this gardener does. The Bible says he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruits. Then he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. The gardener prunes. Beloved, do you know what it means to prune? It means to trim a tree or a plant 
by cutting away dead overgrown branches or stem. Pruning removes the portions that have bacteria, the portions that have decay, that has fungi infection, with the intention of it stopping the flow of that negative bacteria all over the plant. Pruning takes place so that the plant will be fruitful. And beloved, God is your gardener. God is my gardener. This is what God does to us, the branches of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he wants us to be fruitful. And because of that, the gardener comes to search our lives. And what he does is that he will search. Wherever there is infection, he will do his work. Wherever there is deadness, he will do his work. Wherever we are doing it in excess, he will do his work. It is the work of the gardener. God is your gardener. God is my gardener. The Lord is our gardener. That's the role he plays in our life. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 to verse 11, listen to God's word. He says, I planted the seeds in your heart, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It is not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed to grow. The one who plants and the one who walks, who waters, work together with the same purpose. And both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are God's workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. You know what? how the gardener does his work? The Lord Almighty, he is the one that when we allow him to prune us, do you know what happened? We grow. We grow. We grow. The Bible says that he is the one that makes us to grow. He is the one that makes us to grow. The Bible says God makes the seed to grow. You are a plant. I am a plant that the master is the gardener that watches over our lives. And his duty is to trim us, prune us so that we can bear more fruits. So that we can bear more fruit because any branch in him that is not fruitful will be cut off. Will be cut off. And so it is his responsibility. It is his responsibility. And beloved, do you know our responsibility? To make sure that anything that is not Christ Jesus, we should let him trim it off. We should agree with him to trim it off. Because the Bible says no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. And so what the gardener does is that anything that is not of him, he comes with his scissors and he begins to clip our excesses, clip the infections, the bacteria affecting our spiritual life, clip away our pride, clip away the works of our flesh. Why? So that we can bear fruit. That was the secret. You know, that was the heart of David, that in the secret place, he, his gardener was working upon him. So when many that were called appeared, he became the chosen one. Why? Because in the secret place, he knows how to say, Lord, prune me. Lord, prune me. Those things that are in me that does not glorify you. Lord, prune me. Prune me. Because pruning is the process that God touches us in order to bring out the treasures that he has put inside us. He has to prune us. He has to prune us, child of God. Because many are called, few are chosen. The few that are chosen is because they agreed with John 15 verse 2, which says, He cut off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. These are the ones that allow the gardener to prune their lives. 
The ones that allow the gardener to prune our lives. The ones that are able to say, gardener, search me. Anything that is offensive, any bacteria, any fungi that is eating up my destiny, eating up the will of God in my life, contaminating my spirit, man. Lord, trim it out of me. They agree with the Father. And that work is done. And that work is done. And on the day the anointing is flowing, it will always locate the one that goes through the pruning process. That goes through the pruning process. Child of God, let us learn something. Let us learn something. The heart of David. Let us learn something. We want to make some comparison. You see, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, I am reading from verse 12 to verse 20. The Bible says, Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, the Ephratite, from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at that time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, Shemai, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army. But David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in, in Bethlehem. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champions strutted in front of the Israelite army. One day, Jesse said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. I will give these 10 cuts of cheese to, and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelites army at the valley of Elah fighting ag against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early in the morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts or, and battle cries. You know, David was one son among seven brothers. The youngest one. The youngest one, his elder brothers, they were in the army. Beloved, the Bible says one day, Jesse called his son David. And what did he do? The Bible says he gave him an instruction. Take this basket of, of, of bread. Go and give your brothers. Then look for their captain. Give them this cheese. The father was sending this son to where? Battlefield. Where war is on. Where the enemies are gathered. That was where the father was sending him to. But what was the character of David? Did David argue with the father? Did David question his instruction? Did David say, ah, you want to kill me? Why are you sending me to a place like that? You know what happened? The Bible just tells us that David left the sheep with the other shepherd. He went and put himself together. Then set out early the next morning. That's the heart. He set out early the next morning and went to run his father's errands. We want to compare it with a passage that speaks to me, that speaks to you. Matthew chapter 21, from verse 28 to verse 30, I read, first of all. The Bible says, but what do you think about this? A man has two sons. He told the older son, go out and walk in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go, he said, yes, sir. I will, but he didn't go. Let's think about it. Let's just compare these hearts. Let's just compare these hearts. The same way the father of David sent him, this man has two sons. And came to his sons and said, go and walk in the field. Remember David's father? His own, David's message was even to go to the war, where the war was on. The father gave him that instruction. David did not argue. David just got up in the morning, tied the things up. And you know what he did? He went on the master's errand. He went on the father's errand. Now look at the parable of the two sons. This man, this father has two sons, the older one and the younger one. 
And the father came and said, son, go out and walk in the vineyard today. Just an instruction for that day. What did the father, what did the son do? The, father, the son said, no, I won't go. No, I won't go. Then later he changed. No, let's, let, he said, no, I won't go. No, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. The second son, the father said, go. He said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. And the Lord asked this question. Which of these sons obeyed the father? Beloved, we are one of these three. We are one of these three. Our heart is either like the heart of David. That the father will talk. As long as the father has spoken, hey, all he hears is obedience. There is no negotiation anywhere. There is another song. The father speaks his bow to say, no, I won't go. No, I won't go. Then later, he has a retreat and decides to go under prudence. Then comes back and say, okay, let me go and do it. Another one, they thought, yes, yes, yes. I say, yes, Lord. I say, yes, Lord. I say, yes, Lord. The song that we used to sing, the third category. Yes, 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 Lord. But look at the real heart. It doesn't go at all. It doesn't go at all. Child of God, which one are you? Which one am I? Which one are you? Which one am I? Because the anointing looks at the heart. The anointing searches the heart. The anointing goes after the condition of our heart, beloved. The anointing searches, searches. God looks for. He doesn't waste oil. If we want the real oil, our hearts must be acceptable before him. Our hearts must be acceptable before him. The father has tax for all of us. But we are all reacting in different ways. But when God wants to choose a vessel, all of us say, yes, Lord, choose me, choose me, choose me. We all want that throne. But child of God, are we ready to pay the price? Are we ready to go through the pruning process? Are we ready to say, Lord, cut off my excesses? Are we ready to say, Lord, I agree with you. Prune me. Because we must go through the pruning. That is what happened to the first son that later went back and did it. While the process between his no and his obedience was a process of pruning. That pruning was that he allowed the father, he allowed the Lord, to remove bacteria from him. The bacterial infection that made him to say no to the father, I won't go. He went through the pruning process. He went through the refiner's fire. He allowed the pruning to take away the no of his life and came back and said, yes, I will do it. Beloved, it is very, very, very important. Our reaction to the father, the way we respond to the father, because look at it from verse 31 of Matthew 21 and to, to, to verse 30, Matthew chapter 21. And I'm reading from verse 31 to verse 32. He said, which of these two obeyed the father? They replied the first. Then Jesus explained his, explained his meaning. He said, I tell you the truth. Corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will come into the kingdom of God before you. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live. But you didn't believe him. Even tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. Jesus is passing a strong message to me. I'm passing a strong message to you. The first question he asked, which of these two obeyed the father? Now that question will be asked over your life. It will be asked over my life. Did you obey the father? Very important. How we react to the father's instruction. Did we obey? Then the message comes. He said, this is the truth. Corrupt tax collectors, prostitute, we enter the kingdom of God before you. Why will corrupt tax collectors, prostitutes, enter the kingdom of God before me or before you? Why? 
talking to us, the saints, why will corrupt people enter the kingdom of God before any of us? Child of God, may it not be our portion. May it not be. My portion may not be your portion. To be last in the kingdom of God, God forbid. Jesus was passing a strong message. He said, for John the Baptist showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe. The right way of living. The right way of living. We determine whether we enter the kingdom of God or not. The right way of living. Jesus said something. He said, see tax collectors. See prostitute. They listened and they did. They listened and they obeyed. We want to understand it further by looking at Luke chapter 19 to learn from the lives of those that were able to enter. Child of God, Luke 19. And I am reading verse 1 to verse 10. The eternal words of the living God. The one that has the final say. The Bible says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way to the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. He tried to look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore tree beside the road. For Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, the grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor Lord. And if I have cheated people of their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. Beloved, did you read that passage? Remember that Jesus Christ said, tax collectors will enter the kingdom of God before many people. Remember the word of God says tax collector. So we want to look and learn from a tax collector. The Bible says Zacchaeus was even a chief tax collector. What was the life of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was once upon a time a wicked man that took and took and took from people. But Zacchaeus heard about Jesus. Look at the heart of Zacchaeus. The heart of Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus Christ. When men were judging him and when men were saying that this one is a notorious sinner, God was that looks at the heart, saw the heart of this man. Saw the heart of this man. Jesus located him and said, Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your house. What made Jesus to say he must be a guest in the house of Zacchaeus? The Bible says that what? He showed himself to be what? A true son of Abraham. A true son of Abraham. What made Zacchaeus to be a true son? Sonship is about growth. It was because of the growth that Jesus saw in him. Because of the pruning that went on in the heart of Zacchaeus. Jesus just entered his house. What did Zacchaeus say? Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Repentant heart. True repentance. By lifestyle. Prove Zacchaeus a true son of Abraham. True repentance. Pruning. Pruning. The areas where he used to cheat people. He said. Circumcise my heart. I repent of it. In fact, this is a proof of my repentance. Instead of giving them one back, I will give them four times. The heart. The heart. The heart. Beloved. 
That's why the Bible says that God look at the heart. People were looking at the outward of Zacchaeus. While they were looking, Zacchaeus was entering the kingdom of God. Zacchaeus, Jesus was now in his house. While others were there judging, the ones that have been following Jesus since. Beloved, let us learn something. Let us learn something. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I am reading from verse 1 to verse 2. The Bible says, Soon after, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirit and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he cast out seven demons. Remember, Jesus talked about seven prostitutes who entered the kingdom of God. The Bible didn't really tell us whether Mag Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. But what the Bible tells us was that Jesus casted seven demons from her. That means pruning, pruning, pruning. As followers of Jesus, we come to him with all kinds of demons inside us. That's how we come to Jesus Christ. We come to him with all kinds of infections. Not just the way the spirit man is sick and polluted with different kinds of bacteria. And when we come to Jesus, the expectation is that what? Pruning will take place. He will cleanse us. He will, he will purge us. He will sanctify us. Let us learn from Mary Magdalene. Out of these people, the Lord mentioned her and said, Mary Magdalene, from whom he had casted out seven demons. What happened there? The pruning process. Many are called, few are chosen. If the Lord told us that he casted out seven demons from, from Mary Magdalene, do you know how it benefited her, child of God? Do you know how it benefited her? Beloved, it benefited her according to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Chapter 2 from verse 19 to verse 21. It says, But God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription. The Lord knows those that who are his, and all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of pure, are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasion and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. You see, let us learn from Mary Magdalene. Yes, yeah, she came with her demons. The same way you came with your demons to Jesus. And the same way I came with mine too. But, the re but after coming to Jesus Christ, he begins to walk in our lives with the motive of casting out that demon. With the motive of purging us. Because in a great house, there are many vessels. Some are gold. Some are silver. Some are clay. Some are hay. Why? Because of the process of purification. We are not all the same quality. Depending on how we allow God to prune our away the dross of our lives. The ones that are God allow themselves to be refined by the refiner's fire. The ones that are silver went through the refiner's fire to be a silver. But clay came as clay and is remaining as clay. Wood came as wood and it has remained as wood. We are all mixed in God's hands. Our qualities are not the same. We are all in the same house, but of different qualities, child of God. The reason is found in the word of God. The Bible says, if you keep yourself pure, if you keep yourself pure, and how do we keep ourselves pure? By allowing the gardener to prune us. By saying, search me, O oh Lord, and see if there is any offense, anything in me that offends you. Then prune it out of my life. That makes us to be a vessel unto honorable use, just like Mary Magdalene. Look at the honorable use that this vessel became. The Bible tells us in John chapter 20 from verse 11 to verse 18. 
the Bible says Mary was standing outside the tomb, crying as she wept. She stopped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus was lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing here, there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sigh, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't ascended to the Father. But go, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them this message. Beloved, the one that will announce the resurrection of Jesus, is it a small messenger? It's a chosen vessel. A chosen vessel to see Jesus before he even ascends to the Father. Is it a small thing? What qualified Mary Magdalene? The heart. The heart. The heart. Looking for Jesus. Even at the, group, the grave side. They are crying. The heart. The heart. That's why the Bible says, men, look at the outward. God looks at the heart, child of God. God looks at the heart. God is looking into your heart. God is looking into my heart. God looks at the heart. And it is our heart that qualifies us to be used for noble purpose. Mary Magdalene was look, look, used for noble purpose. Why will she even be at the graveyard and call, are you the gardener? Are you the gardener? Are you the gardener? Child of God. Mary went through a pruning process. Because of that, in a great house, there are many vessels. Some unto honor, some unto dishonor. When God wanted an honorable vessel for a great purpose and a great assignment. Love, she was a noble vessel. She was a noble vessel, even though she was. She used to be a prostitute. People would call her, oh, that woman. Some would, might even be suspecting that she's still a prostitute. Meanwhile, she is entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of many. Child of God, what is the condition of my heart? What is the condition of your heart? It will please you to know that God is looking into your heart. God is looking into my heart. It is the kind of heart that we have that will determine where that the oil will flow or whether it will not flow. God looks at the heart. You cannot deceive him. I cannot deceive him. Child of God, if anyone will purge himself and make himself pure, the Bible says he will be used for an honorable purpose. And so why not we search our heart today and begin to pray the kind of prayer that David prayed so that child of God, he will use you for an honorable purpose and he will also use me for an honorable purpose. Beloved, are you dear? You are not born again. Jesus is not the master of your life. Will you join me and pray and say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. Forgive me my sins. Wash me. Lord, cleanse me. Sanctify me. I want to be a useful vessel in your hands. Prepare me by the power of the Holy Spirit and enable me that I will not miss the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Beloved child of God, Jesus is coming soon. Blessed be the name of the Lord.